Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to uh, our Sunday service at NYBC. We hope you're all doing well, whether you join us in person or online. Um, yeah, uh, if we could just spend the uh, next short few minutes to uh, take our time to uh, just focus on the reason we're here today, to remember that um, we are here to worship our Lord and Savior, to worship our God. Um, let's take time to process the things, to put aside the things that have happened to us over this week, to uh, be able to focus uh, solely on worshiping our Lord. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sunday morning, and we ask uh, for, your, uh, for your love, for your mercy, uh, for your forgiveness, Lord, for we know that uh, we, uh, we are not deserving of the things that you have given us. You have given us your, your son, Jesus Christ, who has died on the cross uh, for our sins in our place so that we may be able to have eternal life with you. And Lord, we just, we thank you and we praise you and we hope that um, through this, um, through your son's sacrifice, through your love, that we would be able to, um, that we would be able to look to our brothers and sisters uh, and see past all the things that make us human, um, our sins, um, that we would be able to love one another as you have loved us. Um, we pray that you would continue to guide us with your spirit, that we may be able to um, glorify you and to love you more, and also to uh, love each other and build um, one another up. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, we ask that you could stand and worship along with us. Sing, bless the Lord. Yeah. 
Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me.
Hudson, for he is our cornerstone. He is the hope that we build our lives upon. Let's sing to Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. not trust the sweetest thing, but only trust in Jesus. Sing that again, I hope. My hope is built.
Let's sing in unity, one voice. be one voice that glorifies your name. Let us be one voice declaring that you reign. Let us be one voice in love and harmony. And we pray, O oh God, grant us unity. be one voice that glorifies your name. Let us be one voice declaring that you reign. Let us be one voice in love and harmony. And we pray, O oh God, grant us unity. And we pray, O oh God, Unity. And let us profess our faith by reading the Apostles' Creed. Let us read together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, I invite you to stand with us and unify our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are holy and in you there is no darkness. You are the God of love and mercy. So often we have passed you by because we do not know you enough to recognize your face and your mighty works. So often we have turned away from you because we do not know you enough to realize your plans and your purposes. So often we have rejected you because we do not know you enough to understand your words and your care for us. So often we have sinned against you because we do not know you enough to understand your holiness and your judgment. Lord, have mercy on us. We confess that we have sinned against you in thoughts, words, and deeds. We have not loved you with all our heart, with all our minds, and with all our souls. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. Forgive us so that we may once again follow your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. 
Lord, have mercy on us. When we nailed you on the cross, you did not plead for yourself, and you did not resist. You willingly suffered and died on our behalf, so that we may live. Help us to know you more, understand you more, and love you more. You are our God and our loving Father. We ask that you will refresh our faith in Christ. Help us to be strong in you as we face challenging times in our culture and in our faith. Help us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and do not lean on our own understanding. Thank you for leading our various ministries, including the church planting projects for the Afghan community and for the Mang Joy community and the fellowship and Bible study groups in Scarborough East and in Keswick. Thank you for bringing the 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 Farsiari family safely from Afghanistan to Canada. May you shower them with blessings when they are adjusting to their new life in Toronto and facing any challenges that may that they may encounter. We pray that you will continue to lead us and guide us in our ministries as we share your gospel to the communities. May your name be praised and your name be glorified as we come together to worship you. We pray for our pastor and the leaders of our ministries to continue to receive your guidance and strength as they lead the congregation and preach your words faithfully. We pray for our brother and sister in our English congregation Cantonese and Mandarin congregations, and also in our children congregation, and everyone that is with us online, may we continue to receive your guidance and protection, your love and care, and your strength and wisdom to witness for you. We especially pray for our dear sister Vivian and Pearly, and dear brother Brian as they mourn the loss of their grandfather. May you comfort them and their parents at this time. We also prayed for the brother and sister in our English congregation, especially for the time that we are going to grow and the time that we are going to have and restore our faith in you. May you come dwell in us and guide us each day. We also pray for the offering we have brought forth to you. May you use it in your ministry. We pray for the speaker today as she delivers your message to us. Help us to listen with a humble heart. Help us to understand your truth and meditate on your words. May you teach us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. And please be seated. So the announcements for today are: New family, our sponsor family from Afghanistan has arrived as of March 6th and settled in their temporary residence. Brothers and sisters who would like to help serve this family and want an opportunity to show hospitality and mercy, contact Pastor Vince. Softball. As we enter the month of March, the upcoming softball season is approaching. However, in order to have a season, our team is in, need, in great need of helpers to facilitate the softball season. If you can help with government, governing, coaching or umping, please contact Pastor Vince. The dates are on the, the last day to enroll is on Saturday, March 25th, and the last day for prayer registration is on Wednesday, April 26th. Service opportunities. We are looking for brothers and sisters that might be interested in helping with some administrative work in the church. If you're interested in helping with any of the following, please contact Pastor Muriel or Pastor Vince. Um, Sunday school. Regular classes resume to today at 12 p.m. Save the dates. English Retreat 2023 will be having an English group retreat this year on June 16th to 18th. And the potential OJ visit is on July 23rd. And lastly, the UK Children and Youth Evangelism Camp to Hong Kongers is on the last two weeks of August 20, 23rd. Um, so the scripture reading for today is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 16. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And there is one body and one spirit, 
just as we were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Father, one faith, one baptism, one God and God of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he descended on high and he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And seeing he descended, what does it mean but that he had been descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also descended far above all the heavens, and he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelisms, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints of the work of ministry and build up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood and the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and from by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Oh, you can even. Whoa. They're working on fixing it. Good morning, church. Um, God is calling, clearly. Are we listening? I could just use this for now. Thanks, Nathan. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I am back from vacation. Um, it's nice to be back. It's nice to see all your faces. Um, I'm thankful for you. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that, God, you are here, that you are present, and that you speak. So we pray that as we hear your words this morning, may it be your voice that we hear and yours alone to speak into our hearts and move us into action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so this week has been a lot, you know, jumping back in to work. We had a fun funeral yesterday. It was tough. Um, there was a lot of things going on this week. So I apologize that I do not have amazing, beautiful slides. Um, a little bit more last minute because I actually finished the sermon this morning. But regardless, God will speak. So let's put it up. <laughs> what are we talking about today? Unity. Whew. Unity. One of the hardest things, right? These days, everyone has their own opinion. People say, oh, you do you. Meaning, I don't really agree with you, but you do you, because that's your opinion. And I'm going to do what I think is right. Right? Difference in opinions. What about the church? Oh, boy. <laughs> Shall we get started on that? Lots of different ways to do things. Oh, man, that person is so old, I don't want to hang out with them. You young one, you got no idea what you, th what you think is life, right? You got so many different thoughts, opinions, ways of doing things. Now add language. Us multi-language churches, we got even harder. Goodness, how can we even achieve unity? To this point today, Paul is speaking. So can everyone, I think I saw the ushers handing out Bibles. Yes, please do that. Open up your scripture to Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 16. Up to this point, Paul has been giving explanations and expositions, which is, he's like explaining things about who Jesus is. That there's an incredible God, woo, incredible God, that Jesus died for our sins, raised himself from the dead, he conquered all our sins, and in doing this, he creates a completely new society, a new people, a 
new individual. He brought us to life. We are a new people. So chapter 4 starts, what is this new humanity and new society to look like? And in this new society, there has to be a standard. So that's what we're looking at today. Chapter 4, first one. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, um, again, already immediately, like a, it's about submitting to God, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Worthy of this, like I said, this new standard, this new living that Jesus is now brought, this new people rescued and purchased. You are supposed to live a new way, a certain manner that is worthy for this calling. A new society, one people. At this time, if you remember when Paul's writing this, there were Jewish Christians or Jewish people, and there were Gentiles people. And now they had come together. And again, it's similar to our situation. They got people of all different types of languages, different backgrounds, different cultures, but they were all together. So to this new group of people, Paul writes. So let's keep going. How do we keep unity? What is unity? How can we even attempt bringing all these different people? Like even in this group, look, at, look around. We're of different races. We look different. We have different heights. We have different styles. Okay, we have wonderful Pastor Vince there with a tie. And then we've got our hoodies. We've got our hats, right? We have different clothes. We have different ways we put ourselves together. How can we be anyway unified? So let's see how he starts this. Verse 2. The first part about all of this is unity has to start from something that God does within. It starts from inside. You have to allow the Lord to do something in you. So what are these things? Humility, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. This is where it begins. The foundation of unity starts internally from inside the person about the attitude about the character and integrity about how you behave your moral qualities so let's look at the first one humility what is this humility comes from a word actually it, it, the way the greek word talks about i can move this right okay yes um it t comes from the greek word about submission about a servant that's, that's just a strange word, right? Like, especially these days, we don't like talking about slaves. But, and we don't like talking about being shackled and all this kind of thing, or being low. But humility actually comes from the word lowliness. It's about lowering yourself. That's what humility is. A lowering of yourself completely, but also of the mind. A recognizing in you that who I am is not above other people. I have to understand that my worth and value is not greater than other people. That even Jesus came down and became the lowest of lows to bring his people back to him. You see, the problem why we don't have unity is pride. Behind every discord, not the channel, behind every disarray, Dysfunction is pride. The unwillingness to listen to others. The desire to be better or think we know better. And so it means we need to start at a place where we realize we don't have it all together. We don't got it all right. Humility is a secret to concord. The second one, meekness or gentleness here in our translation. This word means moderation, not too extreme, not doing nothing at all. It means a gentleness of the strong, where strength is in control. I want to ask you guys a question. When you see uh, a person who's in control, do you see them lashing out at people very often? Do you, just because they have the strength, do they beat up everybody? A person who is strong 
is in control. I think that's like one of the first things. I never took ta ta Taekwondo. Anyone took like self-defense classes? Only one? Only one. Okay. You better take care of all of us now. Um, yeah, like the first rule of karate, Taekwondo, any of that is strength is in control. It's in gentleness. A person is only a master if they're able to realize that they don't need to exert their personal right over people. It's about the control, gentleness, when strength is in control. To not have to or must assert your personal right over somebody else. So that means humility and gentleness work together. Unity starts when we realize our status, that we're not better than anybody else, and bring together with gentleness. It has to start here. Now, the other two, patience and bearing with one another, they come together. Without this, well, if you think about it, think about family, think about any group of people. If there's no patience or bearing with one another, there will never be a place of peace. Is that correct? Right? You need both patience and learning to recognize that everyone's coming from different places. Everyone's coming in a from a place where they're not perfect, a bearing with one another. Only from there can people live in peace. And finally, love. That is where it bounds everything together. To love someone means to seek their best more than our own. It means to seek better the, for the community. This binds everything together. So there's humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and love. Now back to the Jews and Gentiles. You really have people from so many different cultures. I don't know if you recently worked with any other groups of people. Uh, some of us are like, yeah, group work. Or some of us are like, oh, we have March break camp. Oh boy, we're working with people. I just saw some looks like, oh man, <laughs> right? We, or you have work and you have bosses and coworkers that are just different types of people, different types of thinking. The church is people that are all different, coming together, all different, different generations, older, younger, languages, methods, personalities. We have quieter people, we have louder people. But the first thing that often happens is we notice the differences. We notice the problems. We point fingers. And then we spread gossip. We spread lies. Maybe it even stems from a place at first of concern, a care. But then we take and we look at all these things, and now we use execution and do different things. And so easily, Satan uses this pointing and looking at others to destroy. Let's flip it a little. When we see disunity as well, we try to also, instead of looking within, we try to fix everything, right? Maybe we need to come up with solutions. Maybe we need to come up with structures. Maybe certain programs. But the problem is with all these things is without, as Paul says, without the internal change of humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with other, one another, and love, none of these programs, structure, none of this would work. We will allow the differences to take control, we lose hope. Unity cannot come about without this foundation within, your, it, within our character. This cannot happen unless we allow Jesus to come into our hearts and change our attitude in our hearts. Or else we only see discord. We only see pride. Or actually, we can't even see our own pride. Unity has to start from our hearts. It has to start with, it's not about me. It's about the other person. It's about the church. It's about learning to love. It's about the other Christian. It's about the brother and sister. They are not the enemy. 
we have to see ourselves as lower and be in humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and love. That's the first part of unity. It starts from God moving and working within. Next, Christian unity arises from the unity of our God. Oh, thank you. Yay. Good. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Whew, that's a lot of ones. I believe there's exactly seven in there. Three of them refer to our God, Spirit, um, Lord, which is Jesus, and God our Father. So seven. Okay, let's let's break down the little text groups here. Have uh, I guess patience with me. I didn't put them all together, but let's look one like separate the different parts. Okay, first one. So the first part, if you look verse four, it says one body and one spirit. Right, that's the first section. Then we skip over to four, verse five. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's all together. And the last part, one God, Father of all, is connected with over all, through all, and in all. Okay, let's do the first one. One body and one spirit. There is one body and one spirit. But let me rephrase this for you to help understand a little bit more. There is one body because there is only one spirit. That means because what Christ has done, there is one spirit that moves in all of us. There isn't multiple bodies. It's not like, oh, um, Angela has one Holy Spirit and Andrea has one Holy Spirit. No, it's the same spirit that works in you guys. Okay, So that means if there's one Holy Spirit, it is a Holy Spirit that moves in all of us that creates unity and creates cohesion because there's only one. That makes sense, right? We're not like being possessed by different things, okay? One Holy Spirit that's in us, okay? Now the second part, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay, again, this is talking about Jesus. So how does this work? One hope, okay, there's, we have hope, one hope, because it belongs to Jesus. There's one faith, because we have one faith in Jesus. One baptism, because Jesus is the one that baptizes us, or we baptize into Jesus. Now, again, it seems weird. That's okay, one, 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 one. But I want to bring it to you, uh, help explain it. Is there's, it's only one because we have one Jesus. Because we have one spirit. So what is it that, like, how can we have faith or baptism? What is that, how is that related? Well, we worship Jesus, the one who came into this world because they saw that we were hopeless, lost, and he rescued us. So that means when Jesus died on the cross, we are baptized with him. We talked about baptism recently where in the water, Right? You go into the water, it represents you are now dying with Christ. When you come back up, we are now being lifted alive by Christ and now ascended with Christ, and we have a new life of Christ. So, the one baptism that we all go through, baptized together into Jesus. The same Jesus is the one who gives us faith to believe in him that he is our Savior, he is our Lord. And same, we can have one hope because it is only in Jesus that we know at the end of all the times when the whole world is end, we can know he comes back and wins and takes us all together with him into having ever uh, eternal life when the world is over to new heaven, new earth. We can only have faith and we can only have hope and we only have baptism into him because we have one Jesus. In him, he makes that all possible. He connects all of us together. Now, the third one, one God. This part, it says, verse 6, one God, the Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Now, the all here is actually, it's talking, well, yes, it's you all, okay? Um, Y'all, like the Americans, okay? So you all here is what it's referring to. Um, you all Christians, those who believe and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I give my life to you. God becomes your father. 
and all of you is now in the family of God. So to help understand verse 6, it's talking about God, one God, and one family. Those who say, I choose and believe and trust you, God, you are now in this one family of God. God takes all of those who desire to follow him and brings you into his family. You are now his redeemed children. He is the Lord that binds you to himself. So that means, if you look at this, the very fact that we have one God, one Father, he created one, one family, one Lord Jesus, he created one faith and one hope and one baptism, and one Holy Spirit creates one body. So that means, if you're like, oh my gosh, brain math. Okay, maybe, it, maybe the math is easy. I don't know. Maybe, maybe for me, brain math, okay. Ah! Sum up. There is one church. You're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isn't there like 10 churches or something? Just in, oh no, probably more in North York. Wait a minute. English is one church, right? Cantonese over there, another church. Afghan, another church. Uh, and then there's another church just like at Kern Road. Wait a minute, what? We're one church? Yes, because we have one God. And that means if we have one God, we have one church. But that is strange, isn't it? There does seem to be a lot of different churches. There does seem to be a lot of different Christians who maybe believe in different things. But I'm telling you, this is what the pastor's saying. No, even in the differences, if they believe that there's one spirit one Lord who is Jesus Christ, and one God the Father, they are all actually one. And all of these Christians, it also means you're not, there's no lone Christians. Every single Christian is part of the church. There is not, oh, I exist here on my own little island, and then, oh, here's this church, and there's this church, and there's this church. No, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you belong to the same church, one church that you can see. But it needs to be maintained. Uh, Next part, next verse. Or go back one, verse three, verse three. Look at this. It says it needs to be maintained. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. This is hard. Often, yeah, there's so many different churches. And a lot of times, churches compete. Oh, no, you took my people. Oh, no, <laughs> we've lost people, right? Like, there's, they compete. Or they're like, oh, mm, you know, that church down there, they're kind of sketch. I don't know. If you, have you heard that before? No. Oh, okay, maybe only until I've heard that. Like, oh, like, oh, yeah, don't go to that church. It's kind of weird. Oh, don't go to that church. Pastor Muriel is like a strange one. Oh, don't go to that church because, you know, the worship leader sings off-key. You know, like, stuff like that. Like, churches, like, talk about each other. They compete. But this is the thing. If we have one God, one Father, one Jesus, one Holy Spirit, what are we doing? Churches actually need to be seeking unity. Different churches. And in the same church, likewise, to seek unity. This something here, verse 3. Eager to maintain. This word is talking about something that is, that means you are eager. That's what it means. But also means you are continuous. You are diligent. You are seeking out unity. The words here is saying, you, reader, when you see this, your, it's your turn. It means you have to do this. Do this now. Do we do that? Do we seek unity? When we understand that there is one church because of one God. Do we seek unity? We look at our church. How often do we talk about talk to someone who's from a different congregation? How often do we talk to someone who's not our same age? How often do we talk to someone who looks and dresses different? Like, oh my goodness, Pastor Muriel, your style. Mm, not on fleek today. How often do you talk to somebody who is not part or similar to you? Church Unity has to be maintained. We have the same God, the same spirit. Why are we not seeking this out? It says eager, eager to maintain unity. 
oneness in this part means we need to come together, to gather, to work it out with humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. One Father who created one family. One Lord Jesus who created one faith, one hope, one baptism. All who have, we have joined in and died to ourselves and live again in. In the same one spirit who creates one body. Church, Christian unity arises because God gives us this. We have the same God. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same Lord. What are we doing? Now, we can, can the Paul continues to teach us how we can have unity. Next, Christian unity is enriched by the diversity of our gifts. Verse 7, by grace was given to each one of us according to the member, measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, uh, so bear with me. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. He gave gifts to men and women. He, in saying he ascended, what does it mean? Uh, but that he also descended to lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who gave ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up of the a body of Christ. For grace was given, it says, verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, this grace here, this part, actually, this whole quote comes from Psalm 68, verse 18. It describes a mighty king who goes into battle. He's victorious. He, he wins. And so when we think about what Jesus has done, he, he won, right? He won the battle. So what the passage is like, oh, but then descended all that, what it's talking about is, well, you can only win if you went into battle, right? Jesus is only ascended going up if that means he actually came down to be ascended high. Does that make sense? Like, you can only go up if you can't come down because God is was in, on, in heaven, and it still is heaven. But the only way he can ascend is if he descended to, the, to our world. So what Jesus did is he came when he was from, went from heaven. Sorry, my words are weird. He came out of heaven into our world, into our sins, into where we were lost. He came to rescue us, die for our sins, so that we can also receive the gifts of who he is. He came down to meet us where we were at. And after he conquered death, as he came as a mighty king, arose from death, he distributed all his gifts, is what this passage is talking about. Okay, that's that whole section. That is what it's talking about. The saving grace that he gives us now, he gives us service grace, grace that we are to give and serve others. The unity of church, of the church, is due to God's grace. Because he has done this already, he gives us power to serve others. He reconciled, brought us in so that we can love other people that we can come and share in his glory, in his gifting of his people. Everything that we have, when we think about it, I think I was talking to a young person the other day. I was like, oh, I want to serve, but like, you know, how? I don't really know anything. Or like, I want to learn to love God, but it feels like I'm doing everything. Every time I write a test, that's me. I'm writing a test. That's using my brain. And I said, well, who gave you the brain? He's like, oh. Uh, Right? Like, it, what we have is given to, by God. The fact that we are alive is a gift of God. That we are free, that we can now be in a right relationship with God is a gift of God. That we can move our hands and feet. Some of us love working out. Those muscles, they're a gift from God. Right? Some of us are more intellectual. Our brains to do the crazy engineering calculations, that's a gift from God. These are gifts that Christ has given us when he is victorious over the grave. And now he says, use those gifts. Grace is given to each of us. Look at the language. It says each, verse 7, each one of us according to Christ's measure. What he has now done, he has gift to you. But what is that measure? Well, the gifts are different. This is a cliche, right? 
diversity and unity or something. <laughs> well, there is truth in this. There is unity even with diversity. If you look around, just quickly, look at look every people around you. We're all different, right? We're all different. Some of us like sports. Some of us are you know, accountants. Some of us are, you know, uh, computer people. Some of us are people people. Some of us like working with machines. Some of us like, like technology. Some of us hate tedious work, um, like working with people. We're all different and we all have different things. Unity doesn't mean that we all look the same. I think sometimes church, we think everyone has to be, like think the same way. We have to do things a certain way. Unity is not about conformity or looking exactly the same. Or is it lifeless? Oh, now I have to behave and be like everybody else. I have to be unified. No, it's not about lifelessness or monotonous. Okay, sorry, big words. Uh, being exactly the same. We can have different cultures, personalities, gifting, temperaments, because the church is a living organism. Because Christ gives his gifts to each of you differently. And he wants you to use these gifts in what way? Let's keep going. Next one. To equip the saints, verse 12, equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Christ. All of the different gifts, the different things that you have are to be used to build each other per one left, to build everyone up. So that to be the fullness, so we all look like Christ. Verse 11 shows you a little bit of why it's so different. Everyone's gift is different. I skipped, sorry, my bad. 11. There's apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, and just the quick explanation here. Apostles, ones who send out people. Prophets, the ones who declare what I'm doing right now. I am telling you what God's word is saying right now. Evangelists, those who love telling people about Jesus Christ. Those who want to tell others about Jesus Christ. Shepherds, caring people, caring for others. Teachers, those who really like, you know, telling and teaching about. It doesn't have to be. This list actually is meant to continue going on. There is many other types. It's not specifically talking about spiritual gifts. That's a different passage. This one is talking about Jesus giving gifts to his people to serve. That means there are gifts of admin. Some of you guys are great. Like tell you, me, t I tell you to go make me an Excel doc, easy. Google doc, easy, All right? Some of us are really good at coding, technology, like figuring out a computer. I, I had to ask like some of my friends, like, I don't know how to use my iPhone. I just found out recently that you can turn up the, the brightness to like higher levels. I didn't know that. And you guys are like, oh, well, guess what? You have a gift then. Hmm? Okay? I just found out, like, I didn't know you could do that. Right? There is giftings that everybody has differently. Some of us are really good at technology, other people are not. Some of us are good at so many different things. Recently, shameless plug, we need admin people. I am having trouble making forms for retreat. I need your help. Someone help me help me make like forms, keep track of stuff. Uh, again, like I am horrible at like finances. Some of us are like, oh, dude, that's my job. Okay, yeah. Some of people, it's easy for you, and others, some stuff is hard. Everyone has a gift. Some of us are very musically talented. Some of us are not, and that is okay. The point of all of this, verse twelve is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. There is a goal here. God raises us up with these different gifts for a goal, to reach a maturity of our faith. Right there, verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood or to become mature, as a people, to the measure of the state stature of the fullness of Christ. The word attain here, uh, verse 13, it means to reach a goal in English. It just means to reach a goal, to succeed in achieving a goal. And those goals is 
to have a mature Christian unity, to know the Son of God. And the last one, to be, so let me just make it a little easier to understand, to be in the fullness of Christ, to be like the fullness of Christ. The purpose of all these gifts is for mature unity, that we may be like Christ and that we may all be like Christ in our different ways, to, but to be like Christ and to help us all know who Jesus is. So I asked this morning, look at yourself. Uh, not this, but I mean like reflect. What are you naturally good at? Don't say nothing, okay? <coughs> Don't say nothing because God created you and you are good with something and you are beautiful in your own way. God made you. What is something that you enjoy doing? How did God create you? Maybe there's admin skills. Maybe you have leadership skills, tech, building computers, programs, sports, people, music, etc. Fill it in. How did God crea create you? And if we are to give everything because God gave you this as gifts, everything back to him, how can you use your gifts today to build the body of Christ? Oh, sorry, sorry. To build <laughs> the body of Christ. Uh, I'm sorry, pointing at the PowerPoint. To build the body of Christ. How can you use the gifts that God has given you to help the church be unified, to know the Son of God, and help the church to look like the fullness of Christ? I'll tell you a little bit of my experience. I came to this church when I was 12 years old. Hey, some of you are like, hey, that's me, 12 years old. <laughs> I came here 12 years old. I was the daughter of a pastor. I was not a pastor at the time, just a regular old person. Um, some of you guys, I think, were at this church as well, um, but younger because I'm old, obviously. I came here, and I was thinking to myself, man, we don't have anything. <laughs> we didn't have an English worship at the time. We had children worship at the time, and I remember talking to God about this, and I said, God, I'm going to lay out who I am to you. I'm 12. I don't know what I can do. I don't know how to, like, help. But, God, if you want me to be here at this church today when I was 12, I said, well, God, I give you who I am. I give you what I am, all my imperfections, and somehow use me. Because I know at this church, being part of the church means to be an active participant an active person. So at 12, I played piano because that's all, that's kind of what I knew how to do. <laughs> I played piano for the Cantonese service. I played uh, piano for Mandarin service and I ran back upstairs and played piano for English service. I think I also helped to lead like children's Sunday school, which some of you guys are doing, teaching kids. Um, and then we started an English congregation at the time. None of us knew what we were doing, but I was like, okay, I can help sing. And I became a fellowship leader. And yeah, you, a lot of it is you don't really know what you're doing. And that's okay because you say, God, here I am. I want to be part of your church. I want to serve you. Use me. And God uses the gifts that he has given you for his glory to equip the saints for the work. And now, I don't know. Honestly, I like you, you asked me, how am I here that now I'm one of the pastors of this church, of the same church I came to at 12 years old? I don't know. All I said at 12 years old was not saying that if you say, God, use me, you'll turn into a pastor. Okay, hold on, pause. But it's saying, God, use me, and now I'm part of teaching the church. Like, that's crazy. How did, how did that happen? It means to say yes. The first part is to say, yes, God, the gifts you have given me, I'm going to use it to enrich the diversity of our church. Or sorry, to enrich the church because everyone here has different gifts. Now, last part, verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Uh, let me write, yeah, doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So here, um, it is talking about children. Paul's talking about children, but 
he's not talking about children in a nice way. <laughs> he is referring to the brattiness almost of kids. I know some of you guys have March break camp next week and like you guys are the counselors and you're like, ah, why are you talking about kids? I want to like enjoy a little bit more. But yes, children can be awesome and in wonderful and beautiful and you just want to hug them. But they can also be unstable. Uh, they don't know what's happening sometimes, so they're ignorant. So they just like, oh, let me touch the fire because they just don't know what's going on. So this is what it's talking about, ignorance and instability. Flipping back and forth. I want this. Oh, no, no, no. Now I want this. This is what Paul now is warning. Church, don't be like children where you are easily entertained by this new latest trend, especially in doctr doctrine. Like, ooh, some church over there is talking about this thing that we should do in this theological way. Oh, now that church is like, oh, this is good. We should do things this way. Don't flip back and forth. That's not what it's about. Unity is not about going with the latest theological find or doctrinal find. Maturity here is talking about as one group of people, you are now, it says here, you're co connected to the head of Christ. Okay, verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Unity means to be mature as a full organizing organism. The church is, as a one organism needs to have its head led by Jesus. And everybody else is coming together, not drawn away, like this says, not, not pulled apart by different oh, new trends of doctrine or different people scheming or different, um, yeah, different ideas. But coming together, joined together, held by Jesus as a head. If you imagine like a, um, all these people body parts putting together or I'd like to say you know you know that um I don't know if you guys do this anymore for young people but when I was young you would have a uh, human pyramid you know what I'm talking about do you do this no human pyramid do you know what a human pyramid is really so you have three people one two three. Oh, sorry I shouldn't move one two three um and then you put two three three people or two people on top of them right? And then another one, and then you're all connected to each other, right? So in that way, it can only build up. But if you're not connected, like if one part falls or something like that, they all fall apart. What happens to the church often is that we're all doing our own thing. We all think our way is right. We all think um, our method is right. We are think our view is right and everyone else is wrong. So what happens when they're not connected to each other? Nothing is built. It doesn't build in any way. Even worse, when the one who's leading, the head, is not Jesus. It's your ego. It's your sin. It's your preference. The body of Christ, church, it has to be Jesus at the top, at the head of everything. But everybody else is not dragged apart by the newest trends, but instead comes together as one body to build up the body of Christ. So where is NYCC English group today? Are we a teenager? Are we kind of bratty? Oh, I don't want to do anything. Can you just do everything? Are we moved in a way like, oh, this, this thing, this church is doing that. We should copy them. Oh, this church is doing that. We should copy them. Where is NYCC English group? Are we talking and learning and growing with our other congregations? Have we been working with other churches to build the kingdom of God? What have we been doing? Have we been seeking unity or have we been so focused on our own individual problems? Finally, verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him. 
The last part of this, how we can come together, is we have to speak in truth and in love. The whole body of Christ has to join together through truth and through love. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, if you are not a part of some sort of small group or coming more intentionally as a group of, as a church growing together, you're in danger because that means you're a body part trying to function without any blood vessels, without any nutrients. If you are a person who sees a lot of issues with our church, but you haven't come together to work together, to talk together, to work and help our church grow together, same. You are a finger dangling out here, not working together with the rest of the church. There is no lone Christians. We have to come together to practice unity. We have to come together to grow together. We have to build each other up in love and in truth. Under the same head, the same Father, the same Spirit. If we're a church that doesn't do anything in love, then it becomes a place of judgment. But if we're a place that doesn't do, any, uh, doesn't do anything in truth, we become a place of mediocrity. We don't tell honest and help to really rebuke and love our brothers and sisters. We become a place of social club because there's no more truth. So I ask us this morning, have we been a place of Christian unity? Have we been a part of building up a church to mature Christian unity? Have you been part of this unity that God already has given in himself? Brothers and sisters, there's no passive members of the church body. Every part of the body is a functioning one, or it's, it's dead, and it needs, it's dead, and it's not working. We must be active children of God that starts from internally with humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, love. Knowing that the unity comes from our one God who is one spirit, one Lord, and one God. So we ask us this morning, will we use all what God has given us to serve him and to build and mature our church? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us. God, we have sinned before you. We have not seeked unity. We have been so focused on our own desires, our own pride, and our own ego. But I pray, Lord, turn ourselves from seeing only ourselves, but instead to learn to love you and to love our church, to give everything, God, all we are, all our gifts to you to serve and build up our church. God, some of us may be struggling not knowing how, God, how can we do this? But I pray, Lord, that you may speak into us. Show us what gifts that we have, that you have given. And teach us to bring this forward to love you and to love others with. May we give our life to you this morning, Lord. That you may use it however you will. And that we may serve and love you deeper and deeper. In Jesus' name we pray.
um, in this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about one body. Uh, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and one Father who is above all, through all, and lives in us. Um, in the Last Supper, Jesus said, this is my body. And of course, we're not literally taking Jesus' body. The bread represents the body of Christ. And we here together, we partake in the communion. We are the body of Christ. We are united with Jesus as in faith, uh, despite our backgrounds. And uh, we have our family here from just arrived several days ago from Afghanistan. Lovely little Eva right there. And uh, we have different backgrounds, even different languages. And, but yet, in the same body of Christ, we are one. And, um, and Jesus said, this is the blood of, of the new covenant. And because of Jesus' blood, our sins are forgiven. It's because of our reconciliation to the Father that we can call ourselves children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. So as we come to the Holy Communion, let us pause uh, for a moment and reflect upon how we live our life in terms of being a disciples of Jesus. Sometimes being a disciple means, oh, I have to do this or that. And sometimes you feel a bit of pressure. Well, it's, it's just heavy. It's not easy because, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we do. Um, by focusing on the things that we have to do, we tend to forget being a disciple is a relationship. It's not just the things that we do, but how we follow our Lord Jesus, how we relate to Him. Uh, do we care about what He cares? Do we love Him? Have we experienced His love? Have we, have we read the Scriptures so that we can know more about Jesus? Have we prayed to Him? Have we talked to Him? So it's a relationship. If we shift our focus on the wrong side of the equation, maybe now is time that we should say, Lord Jesus, uh, I want to get back. I want to follow you. I want to, to learn to experience your love and to love you in response. So let's, let us pause for, for a moment of reflection to see how you have been living your life as a Christian. How's your relationship to Jesus? Let us pause for a moment. Silent reflection. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you because it's because of your love that we can have eternal life. It's because of what you did on the cross that our sins are forgiven. It's because of what the Holy Spirit has been guiding us every day that we can walk with you and we can have hope, we can have peace in times of turmoil and troubles, and we can have hope in times of despair. Lord, we just want to approach you again and confess our sins because oftentimes we have gone astray. We have focused on the wrong things. We have thought about wrong paths. We have let things that are uh, of this world occupy our heart. Lord, we want to come to you today to, to say to you, Lord, Lord, you know that we love you. You know that we love you more than every, everything else, Lord. Help us to have this trust and faith in you. Lord, today we're going to come and partake of the bread and, and the cup. Keep us, give us a spirit of perseverance so that we can follow you every day of our lives from now till we see you face to face, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, baptism, uh, sorry, a community is for all those who are baptized as Christians. And uh, if you're not baptized, I urge you to uh, get baptized in, in Easter, April the 2nd. I talked to Pastor Miro and Pastor Vince about it. And for those who have been baptized, please come forward and receive the, uh, uh, the cup and the bread. And 
and take them to your seat, and we'll partake them together. Okay? So, yeah, please. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you because you are the breath of life and you are the water of life, living water. Lord, we need to look no further because you have everything. You're the source of life. You're the power of life. You're the hope of life. Lord, help us keep focus as we follow you and so that we can look away from the attractions of this world, focus on our life, to live a life that is worthy of our calling, to please you and no one else, Lord. May your love fill our heart. May your glory fill this church so that NYCCC will be a church that glorifies you and and express love to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's uh, continue standing. Let's all stand together and let's respond and sing in one voice.
Jesus will be lifted high above the earth, and the world will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let us be one voice that glorifies your name. Let us be one voice declaring that you reign. Let us be one voice in love and harmony. And we pray, O oh God, grant us unity. And we pray, O oh God, grant us unity. to respond to our God's calling of being one voice in unity. Um, there is uh, offering bags or offering envelopes in front in the blue for you. We can respond both in our actions, in our words, in our life, but also respond and give back to the Lord what he has given us in finances. So and we take this time for a time of offering. darkness we were waiting in the darkness we were waiting without hope without lights till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle Praise the Father. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Be God of glory, majesty, praise for. come and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, be God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. The morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till the sun was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth the world shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, be God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the
May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit be with us from now till forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So yeah, feel free to welcome them. Um, 12 o'clock, uh, that clock is not right. Uh, we will have Sunday school. Uh, my class will be in the small room. Pastor Muriel's class will be in this uh, sanctuary. Uh, and yeah, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I uh, hope to see you guys next week. God bless. To soften my heart and break me apart, I need you to open.